How many people think those guys are nuts? <laughs> and how many want to go do all that stuff right now? Yeah, there's a couple of us in here. So by point of introduction, uh, indulge me in a bit of biography. I jumped at this panel. I've been away from the World Science Festival for a couple years, but when they told me the title of this one, I was all in because this is my happy place. Um, when I was a boy, my dad was a skydiver and a rock climber. And, uh, and a skier. And so I grew up on drop zones watching, looking up into the air for his red and black canopy. He met my stepmom there. And so when I was 18, one of the first things I did was to go learn how to do this. This is the bridge where they invented bungee jumping in New Zealand. We got to explore why countries like that seem to, you know, almost breed the idea of extreme adventure. And this is a doing some ice climbing up in Chamonix. I, I am a dilettante, though, in this extreme world compared to a few of our guests who we're going to bring up, and I'm hoping they can help me understand myself. Was this nature or nurture? Do I blame my old man for this craziness? Uh, or was it just the cues I got growing up out there? Let's find out from people who know a lot about this world. Our first participant studies fear, actually scanning the brains of extreme risk takers and even psychopaths to find out something about the rest of us. An associate professor of psychology and neuroscience at Georgetown University, please welcome Abigail Marsh. Hey, Abby, welcome. Our next participant studies what motivates extreme risk takers and has been known to take a few herself on a pair of skis up in British Columbia. Please welcome Cynthia Thompson. I said, yeah. Also joining us now, the daredevil doctor, an orthopedic sports and trauma surgeon at the University of Colorado. He's the guy base jumping uh, off the sides of cliffs in that video. Please welcome Omer Maidan. Good to see you, Omer. And finally, a prominent author and leading researcher into the evolutionary origins of our behavior, including risk taking. Professor of Biology and Anthropology at Binghamton University, President of the Evolution Institute. Please welcome David Sloan Wilson. Great to have all of you here. This is going to be fun. And let's just start and go down the line and just sort of set the definitions, uh, Abigail, of risk. What does that mean to you? Uh, risk is anything that could have worse consequences than good consequences, I think. But it d the definition depends on who you are and what you think is dangerous for you personally. Right, right. Uh, Cynthia, it, it, I suppose it is. It is, it is a very, a, a, a risk is in the eye of the beholder, right? Yes. Uh, when I've studied athletes, um, some people doing certain types of activities, which most people would consider risky, they don't consider them risky just because they have practiced it or a certain level of ability. So I think it's, yeah, a huge range. Right, yeah. right. Omer, you, you, were you risky from toddling or what, did this come over life? should ask my mom. <laughs> I, I think we should go back first to your intro and instead of who should I blame or blaming my dad, I would say, how can I thank my dad? Thank him, right. Yeah. Exactly for having these type of genes in me so I can enjoy these type of things, right? Right, right. And David, you have an interesting perspective just as an evolutionary scientist. Right, I study uh, risk-taking and non-human species, such as fish and birds and things like that. And do you know they also have individual differences? And the main point I'd like to make from the beginning is that it's hard to know what's more impressive, the individual differences or the flexibility in each and every one of us to take risks under some circumstances. Right, little acts of bravery that aren't going to make the news, but ultimately differentiate, right? Or even rising to the occasion and great acts of bravery in people that you would never expect. Right, right. Is there a line between, you know, what is the line between ordinary acceptable risk and foolish risk? Risk boils down to your experience, right? Each one of us can, if you even look at sports which are more common, like surfing, you can go surf and you can surf um, a two, three feet wave off the beach and it's going to be quite easy and if you're going to fall off your board, if you're even going to manage to stand up. Nothing's going to happen to you. Maybe you're going to scratch the sand a little bit, but then go and surf in Mavericks with, uh, you know, 40 feet waves that every small mistake can result in significant consequences, even fa fatality. That's a different type of risk. And we're talking about the exact same sport. So it's sometimes hard to know, to uh, understand that from the outside, because when you see someone skydiving or base jumping, for someone who doesn't do these type of sports, it all looks crazy. But it's not really, right? If, if you've gone through the right training and understanding and you know exactly what you're doing, it may not look 
too risky for you, but it's not that you are not aware that this is a risk. Right. Just that you know how to handle it well. And if what you're doing brings you great joy or something else of huge value, then maybe whatever level of risk you're facing is worth it and you wouldn't consider it risky. Right, yeah. right. As we get into the program deeper, I want to get into why those risk rewards things happen. You know, centuries ago, the person who went over the next hill was revered by the tribe for certain reasons, survival depended on it. Now it's like getting a Red Bull contract is, you know, the incentive for, for some. But we have some interesting uh, video of a, of a baby cliff uh, study that was done, uh, I guess, I don't know when, time space. But you set up this uh, sort of virtual cliff for an infant, and it's safe. There's plexiglass there. She's not going to tumble over. But what I think they found was... Um, there's something innate that makes us pull back from a situation even when you don't even have depth perception yet. David, talk about how risk changes over life, like how much caution we're born with and or lack of. Well, one point to make is that uh, it's not true that babies are blank slates and they have to learn everything from their experience. And so uh, we're born packed with all kinds of psychological modules, basically. So it's not so much of a... Uh, surprising, at least in retrospect, that a very small infant would do something sensible like, like um, uh, pull back from cliffs. In fact, you can see, you can see other cultures. And it's almost the norm in, other, in, in traditional cultures for very small children to not be supervised the way we think of supervising our children. They're, they're, they're by the campfire, they're playing with sharp objects, and even in those New Guinean tribes where they have tree houses, way the hell up, there's little kids, not much older than that, that are just wandering around and there's big gaps in the floor and stuff like that. And it, it seems inconceivable to us, but the parents are not like helicopter moms and, and dads. And, and so they, they learn. And, and actually, some of them might just die, but, uh, but uh, that's, the way, that's the way it is. And we were saying before... That's uh, free-range parenting, the, right? Uh, <laughs> in, the, uh, in the rehearsal, someone was saying, watching that film... I'll bet there's some kids that actually yeah, exactly. are straight over the cliff. Yeah, somebody <laughs> has a toddler out there. That, that kid is, is, is over the cliff right there. But you talk about adolescence as being a particular phase of human life where you're figuring out where the boundaries are, right? Yeah, I think when we think of, of risk as an adaptive strategy that's merited under some circumstances, and that makes a, a ton of sense, especially in traditional cultures, which are much more about survival than in our affluent societies. And to give two examples, adolescence is a time when you have to establish your adult status. And so there is a point, a time in which risk-taking might be merited. But there's another context back in childhood, something called attachment theory, which I'll bet some people in the audience are familiar with, that parenting can be, your, your caretaking environment might be safe and secure or not. And in a safe and secure caregiving environment, the right strategy for a kid is to be exploratory, but I'll check back to the caregiver knowing that that's always safe and secure. If your caregiving environment is more insecure than that, there's two strategies in children. One is, one is a clinging strategy. So basically, you don't let the parent out of your sight. The other is a strategy of like premature fledging. And those kids, you, you know you're not going to get support from your caregiver, and so you're kind of out the door. And those would be the kids that we would think as extreme risk takers. Why? It's because they have to go it alone. And so these are some of the situational differences, I think, which call for either safe or risky strategies, depending upon the, the attached benefits. You can't ever talk about risky behaviors as costly and make sense of it without knowing what the benefits are that are associated with it, because it's the cost-benefit ratio that's needed to make sense of, of how you behave. Right. Cynthia, when you started into this field and were obsessed, did it come from your own Skiing life, what was it about this uh, set of folks that, that fascinated you? I actually spent some time in between degrees in the Canadian Rockies, and I met a number of athletes there who it had, had been into a lot of various risk-taking behavior in their youth, and then they moved to a mountain town, they found the sport, whether it be ice climbing, skiing, um, paragliding, etc., and that then was the focus of 
their passion and they, st they, they stopped or you know, decreased their other risk-taking behaviors because that became the outlet. So I was motivated to study this um, out of the, just the question, can sports serve as an alternative outlet for these same types of risk um, drives? Gambling, yep. ad addictions yeah. and those sorts of things. All of those, yeah. Right, right. And uh, Abigail, I understand your you know, draw to this field came from a couple personal stories. Yeah, that's true. So the one of the populations I study is people who uh, risk undergoing surgery so they can donate a kidney to a stranger, um, which most people would view as an unacceptable risk, but for them seems like the most obvious thing in the world. Um, and one of the reasons I'm interested in this um, population is because my life was saved by an altruistic stranger when I was a teenager. Uh, and I was in a car accident and I actually driving over a freeway swerve to avoid hitting a dog, which you shouldn't do, just you have to hit it. Uh, because what happens when you swerve to avoid an animal is what happened to me, which is my car spun out across the freeway. And I ended up in the fast lane of the freeway on an overpass with no shoulders, facing backward into the oncoming traffic, and then my engine died. And I was 100% sure that I was gonna die too. I had no phone, it was the 90s. Um, there was no shoulders to escape onto. I really didn't know what to do. Um, and then suddenly a stranger appeared next to the passenger side car of my window, who I later figured out had pulled over on the opposite side of the freeway and run across five or six lanes of freeway traffic in the dark to reach me. Uh, and then he got my car up and running again, got me back across the road, and then he disappeared. So I never had the opportunity to ask him why he did what he did. Um, but I've been curious to um, study similar populations ever since. We're going to get into that field a little bit later with another special guest uh, who's joining us as well. But Omer, I'm just curious about, do you have family? Do you have uh, children? Three kids. Three kids. Did becoming a father alter your definition of risk? I'm not sure that it, it, it altered the definition of risk. It definitely changed me a little bit. Um, and I would still do the same type of sports and, and be engaged with these on a regular basis, but maybe I will mitigate some of these sports in terms of the, the level of risk I would take, but nowadays I can do that with them. And obviously they are all involved in extreme sports themselves and they're enjoying it too. So I think it goes back to what you guys discussed before about the culture aspect, because we can have the discussion over here, but the exact same discussion can be um, uh, done elsewhere and going to go to the to a completely different level with regard to what you're doing and what is acceptable. If we go back to the bungee jumping that you showed before, so bungee jumping was actually invented in Pentecost Island, Vanuatu in the Pacific, right. and they doing it over there at the age of 12 or 13 mm -hmm. is some sort of a maturity ceremony and everybody have to do it. And they do, it, they do not do that with a proper rope, they do it with roots. Vines. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> yes. and people die there on a regular basis, but this is what they do and it's you know, culturally completely acceptable. Right? Yeah. And it, not something that's going to be accessible over here in Manhattan. Right. Yeah. So these are things that we need to understand. We're not all the same. We're not all judging, the thing, uh, judging these type of sports by the same point of view. And it's important to understand that to begin with. Right. But, uh, but somewhere in there, the common thread is somebody who's, whose red line is out here as, a, as opposed to here. And we kind of want to figure that out as, as we go use. And let's use some examples. How many of you have heard of Alex Honnold? Uh, this movie, the F Free Solo, just won the Academy Award for Best Documentary. He is this otherworldly human uh, rock climber, uh, American rock climber, a free soloist, which if you don't know is these are guys who climb without ropes. So one false move, one slip, and you are dead. And he famously climbed El Capitan. I mean, he is such a superstar in this field. This is a climb, 3,000 foot, uh, sheer rock wall there in Yosemite Valley, and it sometimes takes some, you know, professional climbers days or even weeks uh, to do it. He set a record in under four hours scrambling up this, and as you see in the movie so brilliantly, it, 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 he's not a, some devil may care, you know, nihilist. He doesn't, he, he very much loves life. He has a, a romantic interest in the film that grounds him in many ways. But, um, but what he does <laughs> it, it defies most logic for the rest of us. So I'm just going to go down the list and say, how, is he crazy? How is Alex Honnold different from the rest of us, not just uh, you know, physiologically, psychologically? Um, my guess is, uh, and what's interesting is that we have done, uh, scientists have done brain scans on him to see if the structures in the brain that support and coordinate the experience of fear are somehow um, 
gone or not working in him, and that's not true at all. Um, and it, what's interesting is in the movie, he talks uh, quite a bit about his experiences of fear as a child. He uses words like fear and terrified frequently in his, um, his recent TED Talk. So it's not that he's not capable of fear, um, but clearly what he finds rewarding about climbing, it's something that gives him such joy and such pleasure that it's worth it to him to take the time and effort to get to the place where he can do the things he does. So I don't, I, you know, I don't think it's crazy at all. I think for him, that calculus is worth it. That's the equivalent of us walking to the store or something like that. What do you, what do you think, Susie? I, well, and they, they don't show this as, as much in the movie, but it, he spent two years preparing for that um, climb. And, and what a lot of athletes that are doing these activities, they're, they're, they've, they're, they're very skilled and um, they've essentially you know, mastered what they're doing. And so they have a lot of confidence in their abilities. And I think that then allows them to you know, suppress or keep that fear in control as they're doing it. I think they, they're, they're still likely feeling the fear, but they're able to push, push through it. And a lot of athletes do talk about that idea of just pushing through it and, and that being part of the motivation for doing these sports. Yeah, that's the ultimate <laughs> satisfaction, right? Mm -hmm. Do you see, what, what skills does he have other than these incredible, ha you know, strong hands? Do you, do you see that he has an extra gear when it comes to fear? Regulation. Oh yes, he does. First of all, he's not crazy. And I think none of these extreme athletes, extreme sport athletes are crazy because if they would be crazy, they would die. Mm -hmm. The first thing you want to try and do something, if not skillful enough, and if you don't know how to handle that fear, that sort of fight or flight phenomenon, you're going to die. And in order to be able to survive through that sport and all these different activities in that same level um, of challenge, um, you need to be extremely experienced. So, this red line you were talking about, each one of these athletes, including Alex Arnold, has this red line that he would not pass, he would not cross, with that specific activity he's planning on in, in the next project in front of him. That, that is the reason why Alex Arnold didn't climb El Capitan five years ago, and he talks about that. He did climb um, Half Dome and some other, which were in terms of, um, not skills, but in terms of, of technicalities, were a little bit less challenging than El Capitan. So he had to step up the ladder and step up his game and with the experience and the understanding, he kept the same distance from that red line, but that red line, you know, kind of start moving away and away from, from the baseline, not for him. Again, he always had that same kind of X distance from that red line, and that's true for every extreme sport athlete. So we can evolve within our sports and we can do things which from the outside looks way more experienced, but for us, the feeling inside and then the consequences and then the the different hormones in our body from physiological and endocrinological, endocrinological standpoint is going to be the same. And we talked about in many different types of research projects we did, what is the, for instance, the cortisol, which is one of our stress hormones that our body uses in order to try and withstand all these type of, of experiments and withstand these type of challenges. What happens in your body? And we took blood and saliva samples from base jumpers before they jumped, obviously at baseline first, and then after they landed. And we saw how it changes within their body. And we looked at the heart rate and how that changed. And you see that very experienced base jumpers, very similar like alpine climbers, that would not change at all. So unlike you, if you're going to, well, you, you obviously skydive, so maybe it's a, bit, a little bit different, but people who do not have this experience, if they're going to go and try to stand on the top of a cliff and they would look down, they would be like, oh, I don't want to be there. But someone who does it on a regular basis, it wouldn't, wouldn't move the needle much for him, mm -hmm. as long as he knows what happens next. And that, that exactly like we talk about fear of heights. When we talk about fear of heights, why do people actually afraid of heights if they're not going to actually fall, right? You stand on the top of a skyscraper and you look down and you know that nothing can happen to you and you still, this is kind of uncontrolled fear. And, and the theory was that what would happen if I would jump? Like I'm standing there at the top of a skyscraper and I'm looking down and I know that nothing can happen, like the fence gets to my chest. But what would happen, in my mind, theoretically, if I'm now going to step up and fall? So you're future tripping a little bit. You're Correct. Yeah. But for a base jump, that's exactly what he wants to do. <laughs> <laughs> that's the reason he got up that morning. Right. And uh, the, um, your science and the, and, the, and the populations you studied as well, at some point, Alex Honnold, climbing a rock with a rope on wasn't enough you had to take the rope off in order for it to matter, right? So are you moving that red line? Correct, but he would, every solo climb that he has done, he had climbed with a rope before, yeah. 
hundreds of times. Gotcha. Yeah. So he can do it, you know, blindfolded. He knows every move like you're a check player. He knows exactly what he's about to do. So it's all about calculated risk. None of these guys is crazy. Again, you cannot survive if you're crazy within that sport. Right. Any type of extreme sports. Yeah. And I have lots, you know, more friends than I can count within that sports. And many times they were not crazy. They just, the margin for error was so small that they just missed it. And it happens in sports all the time. We have to understand that, as you discussed, as you mentioned before, there are some aspects here which are environmental, right? They're, they're, they're all about our culture, where we grew up, what were the opportunities we were presented in life. But some of it is hereditary. And when you look at that baby, two years old, as we said, statistically, if you're going to put 100 babies there, there's going to be someone who's going to fly off, right? Because th this, they have it in them. And we know that if you break down these different traits, and we have the temperament and the character, and the temperament is mostly hereditary. So you have the novelty seeking, the harm avoidance, all of these different parameters. And if someone is low on harm avoidance and high novelty seeking, he's going to fly off. He's going right. to enjoy it. Right. Uh, psychologically, if you're going to do something that's extremely dangerous, there has to be some compensating psychological mechanism that's pleasurable. There has to be a euphoria that more than makes up for the fear, and that's what you, that's what you um, often find. And if you look at emergency situations all the time, and this again is where, where everyday people are thrust into emergency situation or anyone during a war, it's the worst of times and it's the best of times. Talk to someone who's been in war or, or a hurricane or, or something like that, and there's something about the, the, the life and death nature, which is euphoric in addition, to, uh, in addition to dysphoric. And that's what we really need to reflect upon that, that in a life or death situation, life has more meaning, basically, than if you're in an everyday situation. It doesn't matter much what you do. In fact, there's research on what kind of person joins a terrorist organization, such as, as um, um, Al-Qaeda. Uh, what kind of person does that? It might be a middle class person. And the, the answer is, is meaning, a strong sense of meaning, that you're participating in something which actually makes a difference as opposed to an extremely bland, humdrum, you know, suburban, let us say, life. So the idea that, that, that these activities give a sense of, of meaning and consequence to what we're, we're doing, I think, is in part, part the motivation for it. Um, I don't know if you've been following the news from uh, Mount Everest in the last couple of weeks. I think we have some uh, footage. It's been one of the deadliest climbing seasons. Our last 11 perished, not because of the weather turn, which is uh, most fatal, but because of the crowding. I mean, Sir Edmund Hillary was the first man up Everest. It was in the 50s. In just a couple generations, you could put a Starbucks up there uh, and turn a profit. And I, I'm sure a lot of this has to do with equipment and a false sense of security when you have oxygen and those sorts of things, like climbers in the past, when you see that line on Everest as somebody in this world, what does that tell you about, you know, sort of the culture of risk-taking and how it changes according to perception? I actually think it's a very unique example because this time it's not about the people. I don't think it's about their risk or their risk behavior or what they plan on doing. I think it's about Nepalese government and permits. There were just too many people there for the time. Like, you, you could climb perfectly well and get there and do everything by the book as you planned and, and planned for that and, and trained for that for a year or two or more. And on the way down, there was just not any you know, route. It was all packed, all jammed. So this is a little bit of a different example. It's, yeah, it's, hor you know, it's horrifying. And we saw, I think, by now 11 or even more fatalities there in the past couple of weeks. But it's not because of the people. Not, not because of a certain you know, specific individual. It's because there were too many of them at a certain point, at a certain time, and that's about it. But I guess I'm asking about the pool of people willing to spend that money and time and pain to go up and say, I, I, I climbed Everest. I agree. <laughs> yeah, whether that's something that's growing over time. It, it does, yeah. like the participation in every, every other type of extreme sports. Yeah. Um, it grows because of the media around it. Mm -hmm. You mentioned before Red Bull. So, you know, yeah. nowadays or in the past decade, being a Red Bull athlete is like being, you know, like stamped as, yeah, I'm there. There's a credibility behind that. And... Back in the day, when I started doing these type of sports, there was not much, there was not really any way to see that, that there was not any forums, no Facebook, no YouTube, not Google, not anything, right? right? So if you would film that, 
if you would be even able, able to do that in the right way, you would keep it for yourself or maybe for your friends. Yeah. But nowadays, where so many people are, are so inspired, which is great by doing so, they don't really understand what sits behind that because so many times you see only the successes, you don't see the failures. Yeah. Right? You go up on TV and you see someone, you don't see that it took him about 100 times to complete that jump, but you see the double backflip and you're like, wow. But then you don't really go and try it yourself. Um, the ones who do, obviously, again, Darwinism-wise, they, they are the crazy ones who die. But within these type of sports, people don't understand how much, cal how much uh, of a calculated risk there is behind that. People don't just go and do things. They, they plan on it, they train for it, and they do it. And sometimes it takes years to get there. Yeah, right. Um, Cynthia, you've done some work. You know, we talk, we're talking about Alex Honnold or even hopeful uh, Everest Mountaineers as people who practice, deliberate. Mm -hmm. Very different from the jackass hold my beer crowd, right? <laughs> uh, and y you, you break it down between, what is it, sensation seeking versus impulsivity. impulsivity. Yeah, like. so they're, they're personality traits that are often um, combined. So there's a one personality measure that calls the overarching trait impulsive sensa sensation seeking, but they're actually also dissociable traits. And, um, the neuroscience behind them has also, um, you know, has shown that they can be dissociable. And so I decided in my study of two sports groups. So in this study, I looked at a group of high-risk sports um, participants and a group of low-risk sports participants, and I measured their personality. I measured both the impulsivity component and the sensation-seeking component. And I found that high-risk sports and low-risk sports, they do not differ in impulsivity, and they do not differ from controls in impulsivity, meaning that when people describe athletes as reckless, in my opinion, that's incorrect because, as, as Omar said, they're taking calculated risks, but they're planning. They're planning in advance with their training, and that is a component of, of having lower impulsivity. Yes, they are higher in sensation-seeking, so in the um, right-hand side of the graph, you can see that the high-risk sports participants score higher on sensation-seeking than low-risk sports participants. And this is quite consistent uh, across the literature. There's been a number of studies that have shown this. There's other components involved, but um, consistently, high-risk sports people do score higher than the general population in sensation-seeking. Yeah, so they're careful daredevils, right? Yeah, uh, yes, exactly. Yeah, in that way. That's interesting. Let's talk about fear. Uh, at the heart of this whole conversation. Abby, this is your, your area, and they, I guess explain how they do brain scans and show people scary photographs like these. Yeah, so uh, classic studies trying to understand the neural underpinnings of the um, capability for experiencing fear will show people images uh, in an uh, MRI magnet um, that's taking pictures of the brain that allows us to track activity within it. And when most people look at images similar to these of snakes or uh, people jumping off of high things or images related to death, uh, in most people you'll see increased activity in a network of structures in the brain that coordinates the experience that feels like fear, um, with the core structure within that network being the amygdala. Um, which it's not that fear lives in the amygdala, but the amygdala is coordinating activity and all the rest of the structures uh, that we need. And it sends signals to the hypothalamus, which uh, gins up the fight or flight system, gets uh, cortisol revved up, um, gets our muscles tense, all of those body changes. And then also to a really deep structure in the midbrain called paraqueductal gray, which is responsible for really primitive fear-related behaviors like um, you know, if you're already feeling a little bit keyed up, you're watching a horror movie, and then uh, somebody taps you on the shoulder and you jump a mile, that's the periaqueductal gray, you can think, um, with a little input from the amygdala. Okay. And then there was also some work, uh, did you do the w work with the rats, where it comes to overcoming these fears, because it's, it's, uh, it's not destiny, even for these critters, right? Uh, right. It's the, it's the big difference between um, being fearless and being brave, really. Um, the difference is people who are fearless are insensitive to the fear, right? They're rash, they're reckless. This is the difference we've recognized uh, going back to Aristotle. Um, what's different about being brave is that you were able to overcome your fear in the service of something that you value more. And there was a really cool study uh, done in rats recently by a researcher named Rickenbacker um, showing how even a mother rat, rats are surprisingly good mothers, um, are able to overcome their fear of getting an electric shock when their pups are with them. 
And so we know that uh, when you normally train a rat to fear getting shocked by, for example, pairing the smell of peppermint with a foot shock over and over again, it's a basic fear conditioning study, then the, the rats will do what rats always do when they're frightened, when they smell that peppermint, which is they'll freeze. And again, that's paraquedental gray, and it's a self-preservative behavior, you know? It's a, if you're a prey species, you freeze when you're frightened. But what's really interesting is that it turns out that mother rats don't do that anymore when their pups are in the box with them when they get this scary odor. And they're able to overcome fear for themselves in order to protect their pups instead. So if you are okay with anthropomorphizing rats, you can say that the mother rats in this case are being brave. They're risking their own safety by overcoming their desire to freeze in order to help their pups by either huddling over them or trying to block up the tube that the smell's coming from. That's so fascinating. Is it the same thing when you hear the stories about the, the mother lifting the car off her child or something, the, the same charges of hormones that, that, that help you do these super Absolutely. Super rat feet. <laughs> Absolutely. So yeah. the research I've conducted suggests that altruism in general emerges from the same network of structures that enable us to parent. So the parental care system underlies all care-based altruism. And in the altruistic kidney donors that we've scanned, um, what we've seen is that when they are presented with images of people who are afraid, um, we see increased signaling between their amygdala and their periaqueductal gray. We see um, that those structures actually have stronger connections between them than is the case in most people. Um, and that seems to be what allows them to overcome fear for themselves. And again, they're not fearless people at all. They would never describe themselves that way. But they're able to overcome fear for themselves when they're focused on helping somebody else. And this is universally how they describe going into surgery. They're not fearless people, but they never describe feeling afraid going into surgery. They're just focused on the person that they're going to help. Cindy, I think you imagined, uh, mentioned earlier an actual scan of Alex Honnold's uh, brain images. We can throw those up there. So, uh, Abby, this is what happens in his head on the right, mm -hmm. being shown those scary photos? Is that, is that it, or? That's right, okay. the amygdala is right in the crosshairs there within that little red circle. Um, and if you uh, look at a typical person's brain in a brain scanner, when they're looking at scary images, you'll see increased activation in the amygdala, which we can render as a little blob of glowing red, a little sun glowing in the brain. Yeah. Um, and when Alex looks at those similar images, which are, not, uh, admittedly, they're not the scariest thing that you could present to somebody, but they do elicit an amygdala response in most people, uh, and just nothing in him. The amygdala is there. It's just it's it's saying it's pretty bored with. I the think picture it's of a I think it's important to stress that if you see a difference like that, it doesn't mean it's innate or genetic. None of that. I mean, this could well be the the experiences, the training, and so on and, and so forth. So often people think, oh, there's a difference in a, in, a, in a brain scan like that, therefore it must be some kind of innate difference or genetic difference, but no, it's not that simple. So it's not the equivalent oh, of like Michael Phelps's lungs or a, or a Tour de France winner's quadriceps, this could be... Well, even those are not, uh, I mean, those are the result of training and so on and, and so forth. Yeah. So I think that uh, it's, it's much more difficult to disentangle nature versus nurture than than uh, to see something, to see a difference like that. Almost everything is a little bit of, yeah, everything's a little bit of both. I mean, yeah. almost every human personality trait, about half the variation in that trait can be explained by a genetic variance. It's pretty typical. Um, and the other half can be explained by everything else. And usually, it's not the everything else that most people think about. Um, what's called shared environmental variance, meaning the things that, were the, that are the same for every child in a household, what your parents did, the kind of neighborhood you grew up in, that's not as predictive as most people think. It's idiosyncratic experiences, experiences unique to you that seem to be the next biggest predictor of how you turn out. Right, it's so fluid. Let's talk about uh, risk in our minds and our genes, uh, ba basically how risk plays a role I in evolution. We've known since Darwin that it's, it's you know, driven by natural selection. People who survive pass along those genes, which raises the obvious question, I, why hasn't evolution led us to be a bunch of couch potatoes and not having to take any risks anymore? Um, what are your thoughts on, on how we still have these folks who are not charging the light brigade to save the nation, but doing it for a sense of just thrill. Well, we know that if you go out inside and you see many species, why do they coexist? It's because they survive and reproduce in different ways. And what's a little more new, we tend to think of spe a single species as being homogenous, but no. It turns out that there's diversity within a single species, even within a population, and those individuals are coexisting because they're surviving and reproducing 
in different ways. So when we studied individual differences in fish, here's how we did it. Uh, we threw in minnow traps, shiny metal objects, no food or any kind. These were uh, little pumpkin seed sunfish. First thing that happens is they scatter. And then the next thing that happens is some of them return and they're sucked by their curiosity into those traps. And then we removed the traps after 10 minutes and we caught the fish that did not enter the traps with a seine. And now we had this difference in by virtue of how we caught them. And then we could study that in the laboratory or we could mark them and we could put them back in nature. And you know, it's pretty easy to understand that if you're the bold fish, you're the first to get the worm and you're the first to get caught by a fisherman. So that's that you grab life by the horns, sometimes you get gored. And if you hang back, then the bad news is you don't maybe eat as much. The good news is you don't get eaten. Not too hard to understand. <laughs> and so, and so um, this is um, uh, how individual differences can be maintained. Now one of the surprises of this research is that what we used to think of as shyness and boldness actually turns out to be something else. And that is how much you attend to information in your environments. And it turns out that some individuals, this is another kind of individual difference, individual difference. Some individuals are inattentive. They just kind of do their thing and they're not, you know, we know people like that. <laughs> and other people and other individuals uh, are processing much, much more. And the way this, is, this was first discovered was they'd catch birds and they'd put them in aviaries and they'd ask the question, how soon do they start hopping around and exploring their environment? So some started immediately, others hung back. That looked like bold and shy. But the ones that were hanging back were actually, they were just taking it all in. <laughs> and then and they could act in a different way. And it turns out, and this is called highly sensitive people. Uh, so it's, a, it's definitely an axis of personality variation. And the way it maps into shyness and boldness is that if you're a highly sensitive person, you're taking all this information in. If that actually results in you know, some successful way of behaving, then you open up and you're bold. But if you're overwhelmed by it, then you retract and you're shy. And so there's a complex mapping between your attentiveness to your environment, how sensitive you are to your environment, and whether you end up basically being a withdrawn person or an extroverted person. That's how complex it is. Wow, that's so fascinating. Do you think that um, if given enough deliberate training that you can build fear or, or build bravery in, in, in the human mind? I think that there is a, an innate component and I think that there will always be individuals who will be too risk averse and, and their harm avoidance, um, the, the, the brain centers that control harm avoidance and govern that are, are, will be too strong for them to overcome that. Um, I, I, I agree there is the environmental component um, right. that you, you can learn, but I think for some people there, there's, there's the line that they wouldn't be able to go over. Does this also uh, uh, apply to like a wanderlust gene? People who crave new experiences, and uh, you're skeptical on that. Huh? Yeah, you know, so I, well, I, I studied um, so I studied dopamine, and so when talking about um, uh, so I'm not sure if it's the same language in, an, in animal models, but we talk about um, individuals having a strong approach system. So so they are motivated to approach different scenarios, and um, they tend to have a weaker avoidance system. And um, one's governed by dopamine, the approach, and then, and then the avoidance system's governed um, by serotonin, and then there's the balance between the systems. And, and in studies of sensation seekers or novelty seekers um, and, and high-risk sports people, they do tend to show, and they've done brain imaging studies on sensation, high sensation seekers compared to low sensation seekers, and they found that they have stronger approach systems, um, but it might be more so the weaker avoidance systems um, that potentially allow them to um, push those limits. So when they're shown, that, you know, there's one where they did an imaging study and they had them do a gambling task and um, they found that low sensation seekers had quite strong harm avoidance centers light up during um, losses. And they found that the high sensation seekers, their brain regions that showed, um, that, that govern approach 
were much more strongly um, lit up in the functional imaging scans. I know you set out to, to compare those with addictive behaviors to mm -hmm. those risk takers. Yeah. Do you find a, an overlap that uh, the ones who, when they're not on the mountain, they, they need something else? So part, as I said, part of my motivation for studying this was because a lot of um, a lot of the sports people that I've encountered had been into you know substance use in their in their early years. But um, as I as I started studying high risk sports people, what I noticed in the literature is no one ever asks the high risk sports people if they use substances, um, and because substance use is prevalent among high sensation seekers. Um, in, in my research on high risk sports people, I wanted to include a substance use questionnaire because I was looking at ge genetics and, and some of the um, genes I was looking at were genes that were also implicated in um, addiction studies. So I just wanted to make sure I was covering all bases by including a substance use measure. And what I actually found was um, my high-risk sports people that actually reported problematic substance use. Um, so uh, according to a questionnaire, they, they scored above a certain threshold for problematic use. I actually found that uh, they were impulsive. So earlier we mentioned, I, we talked about how the sports people that I studied were not impulsive, they're not reckless, they're taking calculated risks. Well, this subsample, which I call sort of dual risk takers, they're high risk sports people, but they also regularly use substances. Um, they were impulsive. And those potentially are the people that are taking risks beyond their abilities. Um, yeah, perhaps combining substances while using, you know, while doing the sport. I mean, I, I, I didn't study that. I don't know, but I know but I did. With us. Pardon, and, and they're they're the ones that they they, yeah. they get weeded out. <laughs> um, so I, I did find that um, there's this there's a, there's a difference between these high risk sports people from um, the gamblers and and the the substance users in that impulsivity component. Right. Yeah, I think it's important to emphasize that in a naturalistic context with humans. Risky behaviors are almost always generating social benefits. Social benefits, either at new, new resources, new territory, fighting. Uh, and, so, and so it's really private cost, public gain uh, much of the time. And this is what segues, I think, to such things as cooperation and altruism, yeah. which you wouldn't think necessarily there'd be a connection. Well, actually, there probably is because this is, uh, in terms of action, not necessarily in terms of motive or, or psychology, but in terms of the consequences of what you're doing, risky behaviors are very often are generating social benefits at a private cost, and that makes it a kind of altruism. Just to show a little bit of where Omer's motivations come from, he didn't want to talk about this next uh, set of pictures we're going to show you because that would be, you know, I guess grandstanding a little bit. But you've got to tell me some stories here. This is you. <laughs> Uh, climbing, but we've got uh, you jumping out of yeah, it's anything that'll fly, basically. Yeah, that's a uh, first ascent in China. Uh, there's just different type of sports that I enjoy, and I think that most people who do extreme sports enjoy. Yeah. Um, but as I said, it's not something you just go there and all of a sudden do. It's something that you train for for many, many years, you know, to be able to do it and enjoy from it. Because if you're going to do something without knowing exactly what you're about to do and how to handle it, I don't think you're gonna, you will be able to enjoy it as much because you're going to be always occupied, preoccupied if you can actually survive that. So in order to be able to do something like that, you know, jump off a thousand feet smokestack, in order to do that and, and to be sure that you're going to do it and you enjoy it and, and you can actually be open to what you're going to do when you are free falling and actually enjoying the, the, the seconds of free falling, right? right? It's, most people have these sort of experience, let's say when they drive very fast and they have to stop all of a sudden and they think they're going to die, right? Like you had. So you have it for a glimpse, but we can relive these moments if you know how to get there and actually enjoy that. But as I said, you cannot just get there and do that. There's years of experience behind that. So you can actually go and, and, and climb waterfalls, frozen falls, or, yeah. or base jump. And the reward for you is when people say, why? I don't really care what they say. <laughs> no, I, I mean, just, what do you? How do you describe the reward? What I, I, is the I think reward I think that I think it's generalized for most people. Yeah. I think that you do. I don't think I think that if someone does it uh, in order to hear what other people say, is not there for the right for the right reasons. Yeah. And I think again, these are the people that probably would not qualify to do it for many many years, right? If you do it for the right reasons, meaning you do it because you have the right stuff and you know that you can survive it for many years and you can enjoy that. That's the only way. Right. And Cynthia, you, when you ski, I mean, you must have a red line that is farther out than 
some peers, but not, but within uh, somebody else's, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, 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 would, I would not consider myself taking big risks because I've been skiing since I was two and, and I'm confident in my abilities. Um, so I knew, you know, just if I'm jumping off a cornice and I aim my skis properly, uh, even though there's a cliff on one side that I can't go down, I, 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 I know I'm going to land on my skis and I know I can land on my skis and not fall down. Um, so I, I think, yeah, I just, I, it's a, a bit, just your confidence in your ability um, it has, a, it plays a huge role. And I also do find, um, I do enjoy pushing my limits to a point where I know it's within my ability, right. but, but I do get some satisfaction out of that. And, and I think that a lot of the athletes that I've um, spoken with, that is one thing that motivates them is, is this drive to um, push their limits within that, you know, comfort zone um, and, and bordering on the edge of that comfort zone because they achieve great satisfaction from that accomplishment. And I think that is part and of what you keeps them going. You had your 10,000 hours, so you felt completely... <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, there you go. But I'd like to address <laughs> the difference since we have just uh, the perfect people to ask this question to. Of the big sex difference that exists, right. of course, there's many more male uh, extreme sports people than, than, than women. Why? Uh, is that a candidate for an innate difference, or maybe not? So, uh, so please. Yeah, so, so we actually studied that. Yeah. We actually, um, our uh, one of our last research projects was looking at female versus male base jumpers, mm -hmm. and even so, there's a little bit of a cultural difference there, there. There is not really any difference in terms of the wiring. I think and they're exactly I the same. Too, yeah. And I think that that's what we see nowadays with a lot of different type of extreme sports. We see that. I think the 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 fact that female leg a little bit behind is only cultural. It's not physiological, it's not anatomical, it's only cultural. Interesting. And I think that within several years, like we see even in medicine, right, there's more female doctors yeah. than, than male doctors, right? It just took them time because of the culture around, but, but now they are completely even and equal. So when, they, when, I, when they've looked at these personality traits, um, novelty seeking, sensation seeking in general population, men do typically score higher than females on these traits. But when I studied athletes, I found that the females scored on par with the male athletes in the high risk sports. But the interesting thing is um, in other studies of non risk sports, as soon as athletes get to an elite level, the females start performing on par with the males in a lot of these personality traits that are normally male dominant. So whether, you know, these females are, uh, you know, exhibiting more mass, so-called masculine traits, um, yeah, it, 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 it does start and, and to And what, the is a what does a hormone like testosterone have to do with it? Because in the public mind, you know, this is like testosterone-driven males and stuff like so that. They so they have looked at testosterone response following, um, well, I, was that one of your, is that? No, we looked yeah. at something. I oh, think okay. it's hard with, with sex hormones because obviously there would, be, there would be different a little bit between females and males, but when you look at cortisol or alpha amylase, there wouldn't be. Mm -hmm. And then you can, you can match it up with validated questionnaire that look at the different traits, the psychological traits, and see there's not much different. Although yeah. testosterone counteracts the effects of cortisol under mm -hmm. some circumstances, doesn't it? Yeah, there, there, there w so there was a study where they did measure testosterone response in um, high-risk sports people, and it was a skydiving study. Um, and they did find the, the female's r testosterone response was uh, slightly less than the male's, but it was still a significant response, um, and it was following the, the jump. And, and so they, they did talk about the interaction between you know, testosterone and, and cortisol there. Yeah. We skipped over a graph. Sh t talk about these wingsuit trends as, we, uh, as you add new layers of risk. What so basically, um, what we can see over here is that when we look at base jumpers, so in the past decade, obviously, the population overall grew significantly. Uh, we, when we started looking into base jumping and we did a lot of research around that, there was about 1,500 base jumpers you know, around the, the world. Um, and, it's, and it's kind of an easy population to study because they are very cohesive and you know how to get to them. And once you get into once you're, once you're one of them, and that was, that, that was, it was easier for me to study them, they were an open up for me. Um, these guys... Bec again, because of the media and, and the X Games and everything else, and the fact that everybody started to see what they are doing and they were inspired by that, the population grew to around 25, almost 3,000 nowadays. And what happened is that then we start matching technology into that. So initially, when we developed the wingsuit flying, and we're talking about 1999, when the first commercial wingsuit came out, and I was one of the test pilots of this wingsuit, 
Uh, there were a lot of different guys. So over and the just to explain, that's the, it looks like a flying squirrel. Correct. As opposed so to it, 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 the, in the previous um, hundred years, so basically all through the 1900, there were about 75 different innovators, um, you know, entrepreneurs that tried to develop a wingsuit, and almost all of them died during that process. I'm talking about 73 out of 75 or something like that. The last one was, uh, was a very famous um, skydiver from France, Patrick de Gallardon, and he developed a suit that then became the commercial suit that we use later on. And, and he died just because of, again, a mistake of stitching his parachute to the wingsuit. When, when we took that wingsuit out and started to jump with it, we were basically becoming the test piloting of that new technology. But the technology was not on par with where we are as pilots, and that's where, where the fatalities came from in the beginning. Mm -hmm. Afterwards, we started testing it in, in, in different um, wind tunnels, and, and we brought scientists in order to help us to develop better wing. Wing, I mean, it's not only a material. There's several levels, that, and the, the air comes in from the front, and it inflates that, and you get an actual lift, like a plane would get. Maybe not enough to get a lift and to go up, but if you get enough speed, you can go up for a little bit and then keep on going down. The problem was that it was much harder to control, right? Because if you have such a large wing in you, or where you are in part of a wing, it's very hard to control that if you, know, if you don't know what you're doing. And then we start seeing fatalities. In the beginning, the fatalities were relatively low in rate, because what we did, we just wanted to master the flying. So we went to, after we mastered it, obviously from a from, um, plane, we jumped off very high cliffs. But all we wanted to do is just be able to stabilize ourselves in the air, enjoy the flight, and land. But once we master that, then the whole field evolved to start doing proximity flying. So now you're not jumping from a cliff and getting away from it. Now we're jumping from a cliff and getting back to the cliff and try to fly next to the cliff between the waterfall and the cliff and start getting very close. And this is where the fatalities start to spike. And what we see in that graph is that in the past decade, we saw more fatality-related, more, more wings at, um, fatality related jumps than anything else. Right. And this is where it spikes. And now we're losing about 30 to 35 um, guys a year out of a 3,000 you know, um, people population, which is quite high. And as a doctor in this world, you must see these injuries. You must see these fatalities. Has there ever been one that gives you pause, or you always think, I, I will be better prepared than this guy was? Well, with Wingsaw, there's not really any injuries. Uh, it's, <laughs> it's, 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 mostly, it's mostly fatalities. Okay, got it. <laughs> um, the, the injuries are usually when you land and you hit a rock or you cannot, you cannot navigate yourself to a very small landing spot. And, and usually in base jumping, we said flying, landing area is smaller than you know, that podium we're on right now. And it's not that it's open, right? You have to navigate yourself between different objects. But I agree that most of these sports in, um, result in significant amount of injuries. And as an orthopedic sports and trauma surgeon, I see that a lot. I think that this is not much different in terms of the actual injury that what I'm going to see with a major car accident that someone was crushed inside the car. What differs here, and we talk about it in our uh, biannual extreme sports conference when we bring different type of uh, healthcare provider from all around the world to talk only about extreme sports, is how do we bring these guys back? Because it's one thing when you do an ACL reconstruction on a soccer player, right? Because after he's done and he's feeling stable, you put him with an athletic trainer and he starts training and he's running between the cone. And when he's feel comfortable enough and, and you can check him and he's good isometrically and why not you send him back to play. But if he's playing, practicing, and he doesn't do well, then you know, the, the coach would sideline him. But let's say that you are a base jumper or a skydiver and you had a shoulder dislocation and I fix your shoulder. And now, before you're ready, you go up and you jump again. And as you come to open your chute, your shoulder is dislocated again. Mm. Right? Then you're dead. So we, know how to take, we, we need to know how to take these guys, whether they are what, what a character that need to know how to flip the Eskimo roll in order to survive, or someone that, that goes down, let's say, climbs or whatnot, and use a very sterile mimicking environment in order to show them if they are ready or not before they go back to do what they do. So if you want to take an, an ice climber before you're going to send him to ice climb somewhere where there's no out, you want to send him to the climbing gym. And if it's a kayaker, you want to take him to the, um, before he goes down, to, down the river, you're going to take him to the pool and you're going to make sure that, you know, he does it hundreds of times and he can actually do that. And if you're a skydiver, send him to a wind tunnel and let him be in a wind tunnel for hours and hours and deploy his chute or play to deploy his chute. So next time when he's actually going there after a shoulder dislocation and a surgery, he's actually ready for it and he doesn't dislocate again in the air. Mm -hmm. Fascinating stuff. Well, let's, uh, we've been talking a lot about how risk, individual risk, uh, works its way through. And now let's kind of switch over to some of the research these folks have done on helping others. And to do that, 
We're going to roll a little video clip here about a, a young man who about 10 years ago made headlines, uh, was a renowned hero, both in New York, around the country, and around the world, for just a knee-jerk, once-in-a-lifetime moment that happens on a commute that could happen to any of us going through Penn Station on any given day. And this was a bit of the news coverage when it happened. Some people spend a lifetime in show business waiting for that one great moment, never knowing when or where it might happen. For one performer, it happened this week. Actor Chad Lindsay, who did something remarkable this week while waiting for the C train at New York's Penn Station. Chad Lindsay jumped onto the New York City subway tracks and rescued a man who passed out and fell off the platform. It was a moment he'd been unwittingly training for. His current role is in the off-Broadway play Casper Hauser, in which he picks up a fellow cast member who can't walk. You know, the, the train tracks start to shine when the reflected light right. of, the, of the train is headed at you. Yeah. And I saw that, and I was like, okay, we need to get out of this hole, like, yeah. pronto. I'm a trained dancer and actor. When someone falls, I catch them. You do what your muscles are trained to do. I hopped up out of there, which I didn't think I could do, but at the point time, I was like, adrenaline. Yeah, yeah. So I could have just been like, boing, dunk. <laughs> I felt like, anyway. Two roles in one day, actor and lifesaver. It's so simple. I mean, you just, if you see somebody trip and fall down, you help them up, you know what I mean? When he isn't uh, saving strangers from certain death, Chad Lindsay's an actor, director, artist based in New York. He is the co-artistic director of Hook and Eye Theater, and helms the Mark O'Donnell Theater at the Actors Fund Art Center in downtown Brooklyn. Big hand for Chad Lindsay. <laughs> First of all, before we get into your story, how many people here, if you think you saw somebody fall onto the subway tracks, would be the one to jump in after them and help them? There's a couple hand, yeah. Chad, would you have been one with your hands up if asked that question 10 uh, yeah, years I, ago? Yeah, I don't know. I, I had never thought of it when it happened. You know, it didn't. I was new to New York, a relatively new New Yorker, and I know a little bit about trains and a little bit about how the subway track bed is organized. So I, I feel like, yeah, I would have. You know, there's a thing here that's about your level of competence and, and knowledge of yourself that, that <clears throat> I think is is maybe the, the teachable moment for all of these instincts, which is that how can we take this instinct to con consistently and incrementally improve, right, and move that red line further and further, and turn it into uh, you know, a, a quest for competence among all of us, that the more you know about yourself and what you're capable of doing, the more apt you are, the more likely you are to, to jump in when you're needed. And, and maybe there, I think, is, the, is if we're looking for a selfless or an altruistic application for, for this kind of thing, it's that we can come through, through these instincts toward wild behavior. We can come to know ourselves better and, and to know our limits. And I think there's something there that, that, that might be worth examining. Before we try to <clears throat> vivisect your brain, uh, take us to that day. What, was, what exactly happened? I know you've told the story a million times, but, yeah. but take us back. Well, OK. So I had one of my several jobs. I had to leave real quickly to go do a reading downtown at a theater. And I was standing, waiting, somewhat preoccupied, but not on my phone, which I think is another aspect you have to make sure you're good at if you want to be attentive to what's happening. Um, <clears throat> and I saw a guy just coming at the track a little too fast. And he sort of stumbled and, and headlong fell into the tracks and smacked his head and pa visibly, obviously passed out and was bleeding. And then I. I apparently dropped my backpack. I don't remember that, but it was there when I returned. Um, <laughs> jumped in, got real nervous about legality for a moment. <laughs> I was like, do you move someone who might have a spinal injury? But then I saw the, the train and was like, yes, you do. Um, <laughs> or you'll have to watch something ugly. So then I grabbed him and put, put the bulk of his torso up on the thing, and two other people helped me. Uh, pull him up, and then I jumped out. And then... How long did that take? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I, I think um, in, uh, just a couple seconds. You know, I, don't, I didn't want to lollygag. <laughs> um, but it was probably less than a minute total yeah, down there? I think yeah, I so. yeah. Oh, while I was down there, I, I told someone on the thing to alert the authorities, and con I said something. That I, apparently, I've had secret training. Yeah. I was like, alert the authorities. Well, what I read was you said, tell the station agent. The station agent, yeah. And you'd never use those words ever. <laughs> when you use the station agent. 
But then you said you said that afterwards, the response to others around you, because you got on the next train. You didn't hang around to get your medal. You got on the next train. <laughs> well, I had a reading. Um, <laughs> so he he was had regained consciousness and was sitting against a wall, and there was a couple cops there. So I was like, train. So I jumped on, and and the the people on the train saw a guy with blood on his pants, and I was white as a sheet, and and I, they gave me a lot of room. <laughs> and then uh, somebody said, no, this, this guy just got in there and saved a dude. And, um, and then one by one, I was approached, and there was this like sort of second wave of altruistic behavior as these women took out uh, hand wipes and started taking care of the blood on my hands. And a nurse came up and said, I'm a nurse, and you shouldn't smoke a cigarette or drink coffee because <laughs> you're, you're in shock. I can see it, and it wouldn't be good for you. And, and people were cleaning me up and... <laughs> in New York. <laughs> <laughs> and then, uh, the way that um, we were talking backstage, I guess the way that you get that warm wash mm. when you give that sense of, of, of just goodness, when you give directions to a stranger on the street. Yeah. This is like that experience times a million, and it changed your career path. Well, maybe, I don't know. I mean, as I look back, so it's been 10 years and I've got a little bit of perspective on the, on the situation, but then I went from being predominantly an actor and odd job kind of guy to, you know, I now work with uh, formerly homeless people. I, I, I've sort of, all of a sudden, if I look at my life now, I, I have this, this element in it of altruistic help that I have built in, for better or worse. It's not easy, but... Um, and it makes you wonder if there isn't something about the recognition or the warm feeling that you get when you hold a door or, like you said, give someone the right directions um, that, that, or jump off a really high building <laughs> that you don't want to repeat, that you don't want back again. And like, you know, what, how can you train that um, for the best? How can you train that sort of addiction, if that's what it is, toward socia you know, societal good, right. I think, is... The hope. So Abigail, this gets back to your story and your research uh, about altruism and people have different motivations for throwing themselves into danger. Um, it just seemed, it, it didn't le seem like he made a deliberate decision, but what did your science, what was the most surprising thing you discovered about this? Uh, the research that we've conducted with altruistic kidney donors, although we've done a little research with people who engage in heroic rescues as well, and there's a lot of similarities. Um, we find that people who are very altruistic uh, have brains that look the opposite of people who are psychopathic. So people who are psychopathic are, do tend to be very fearless. Uh, in addition, they tend to be very impulsive. Um, and uh, one of the reasons is that they have the structure in their brain called the amygdala is smaller than average and it's underreactive in particular to the sight of other people's fear. And this is the really interesting thing about fear. It's one of the best things about fear is knowing what it's like to feel afraid gives you the ability to empathize with other people's fear as well. And people who are psychopathic, um, one of my favorite quotes is from a, a colleague of mine who uh, was studying psychopathic inmates in uh, a prison in the UK and was showing them pictures of people's facial expressions and one of them missed every single fearful facial expression. He didn't get a single one right. Looks at a really vivid picture of fear and he's like, you know, I don't know that what expression is called, but I know that's what people look like right before you stab them. <laughs> so, <laughs> he, <laughs> he's like, yeah, I've seen that face. <laughs> I even can tell you when I've seen that face, but I don't know, like, what is that feeling, right? And so you need to be able to empathize with other, to, you need to be able to feel fear yourself in order to empathize with it in other people. And one of the reasons that people who are psychopathic, it seems can't do that, is because they don't have strong feelings of fear themselves because their amygdala is too small and underreactive. And what we find is that people who are altruistic kidney donors look the opposite. So they're not fearless at all. Their amygdalas are more reactive to the sight of other people's fear, and they're larger than average, and they're better at picking up on when other people are afraid. And we think that this is the reason that they're driven to help other people is because they can understand what that feeling of fear feels like. And so they're motivated to help. And it, it sounds like you had that empathy piece in you. You saw this man. Well, uh, I had my amygdala, but I'd left my periaqueductal <laughs> at the office. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so I was very calm and able yeah. to act. Uh, David, you wrote a book called <laughs> Does Altruism Exist? Uh, Culture, Genes, and the Welfare of Others. And it makes sense that 
animals will risk their lives to save their children, keep the, keep the gene pool going. But uh, how does that explain what he did, helping a stranger? Yeah, that? so altruism, I think that some, there's so much to say about this. And one thing that you brought up uh, backstage and, and again here is that in our particular culture, it's so dominated by the idea that everything is a form of self-interest, that we're dumbfounded by the very concept of altruism dumbfounds us because we've been told again and again and again that we are homo economicus, everything we do is driven by self-interest, which is not the case. When we think, start to think about individual differences from an evolutionary perspective and that, and that these differences primarily are, are, are succeeding in different ways, then not only is there a niche for selfishness, including a niche for psycho psychopathy, mm -hmm. there's even a theory that uh, that there is a, something called primary psychopaths, just born that way, not caused by the environment. And this is a successful social strategy, but only at a very low frequency. In a, in a world of cooperators and the primary psychopath, because they're so rare, actually ca catches everyone unaware. But as soon as they would increase to a certain frequency, then the vigilance of other people would, would kick in. And so basically, that's why they're as rare as they are. They're not zero, they're like 3% or or 5%, but for the rest of us, then the good news for selfishness is that you get to exploit altruists. The bad news is you get excluded and punished. If you're an altruist, the good news is you get exploited. But the bad news is, is that you, if you can cluster, if you can find the company of other altruists, then, then together, as groups of altruists, then you can robustly outcompete selfish individuals. So in fact, it's no puzzle at all to explain this kind of individual difference and say why an empathetic person can succeed and fail and the converse. So this is another axis of individual difference that exists and, and, and who succeeds and the degree to which they succeed depends very much on how we structure our social environments. If we structure our social environments the right way, then we could really cause altruism and empathy to be uh, the most successful strategy. And of course, selfishness won't entirely go away, but it will be, it will be pretty successfully suppressed. And that's the kind of groups we want to have. I, I want to live in a city full of chads. I don't know if I... <laughs> <laughs> well, and there's, that, there's this like, tendency to think of that as the, the, uh, of, a so of a sort of soft society, of, like this, of, of it not having the, the guts. And the, and the, but it, it isn't. And there is this competency right. that is required for true altruism. And I don't want to lose that. that you know, not just so that I don't seem like the softer side. But, but like, you, you know, it, would, it, it wouldn't be good just because everyone would be helping everybody. It would be good because everyone would be rising to their most competent level. Who, you know, everyone would be, the, the expectation would be maybe not that you uh, are a standout on the top level, but that everyone rises to their level of competency. And I think that kind of an altruistic society would be the one toward which we should really aim. I, you know, what do I know? Well, nothing, nothing can detract from, from, from what you did, but I think the, the fact that you were in your theater life was practicing picking up somebody again and again is significant. Right. And, and if you look at marine training, basic military training, what you find is you take you know, pretty much just an average sample of people and training them to do this kind of thing so that actually they don't have to think. You know, they don't have to think because they've done it so many times and in the situation they do it because that's what they've been trained to do. And they've also gotten such a feeling of devotion. It is not the case that we only help our offspring and our genetic relatives. The world is full of situations in which we help members of our group, basically, uh, perceived to be members of our, our group. And we can be as sacrificial for them as we can for our own kin. So, so that's another sort of fallacy that we're selfish except we help our genetic relatives. No, no, it's, it's much more expansive than that. Yeah, that's disproven every day. I did a story years ago on uh, the Pentagon's uh, basic training model for soldiers. And after in World War II, when they did a survey, an alarming amount of first-time inf infantrymen didn't shoot back in their first battle. And they realized, as they broke it down, that fighting for Uncle Sam, or God and country, breaks down in that, in that moment of fire. And that's when they started giving you a battle buddy in basic training. And it's you and us. And if, and if I do something, if I screw up in basic training, I have to dig a grave for you, write a letter to your mom. And that then, by the time you got to Vietnam and beyond, 
that rate of, of non-fire in that first uh, thing drastically yeah. changed. And I, want, I wanted connection. to say something else about psychopathy, that uh, it is just, it's just the fact of our species that not only are we so good at within group cooperation, but so often that's directed host hostily to other groups. Mm. And so to be inhumane towards other groups is as natural for us as to be humane to members of our own groups. And what that means is, as I like to put it, all of us are, s are facultative psychopaths. It's within the human repertoire of almost all of us that if we have someone that we truly regard as an enemy, enemy then we, we, we dehumanize them and we call them by other names, animal names, cockroaches, vermin, and we could actually get ourselves into a psychological state where we could do terrible things to those people and not feel we turned off our empathy towards yeah. them. And so that's part of the repertoire of almost all of us. And we need to take that very seriously. Very good point. We are out of time now, but I want to give a hearty thanks to our entire panel for their time and wisdom.